Under 21 Convention, Orlando, Florida, 2016. Here we're going to learn about something that is super important. A lot of the guys have been talking about our external beliefs, our internal beliefs, but now we're going to learn about our expression through what we wear, how we present ourselves, but not just our clothes, but the philosophy of that, in particular, men's style. So who we have today is a pretty amazing guest. I'm very excited, and I know you guys are all going to dig this a lot, but we have Tanner Guzzi. Come on stage, my man. Thanks. Good stuff, man. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, guys. I am excited to be here, and uh, I've really enjoyed what I've heard from the other speakers thus far. This has been a phenomenal conference, and I hope you guys, I would imagine, I mean, it was fun to kind of walk through and weave my way through and see the notes that you guys have taken, and I can see the value that you're getting from it. Uh, I know the value that I've gotten from it, and I hope that I can contribute to that as well. So before I dive in, I feel like I want to tell you guys a little bit about me, because that makes this a little bit easier uh, for all of us. So. Tanner Guzzi, um, I am from Salt Lake City, Utah, and there are quite a few questions that immediately pop into your heads as soon as I say that. No, it is not the mecca of menswear. No, I, nobody ever really thinks that anyway, right? <laughs> um, yes, I'm Mormon. Uh, no, I do not have multiple wives. And uh, yes, I did serve one of those missions where uh, you wear black suits and name tags and do all that. So uh, there's that aspect of it. Um, I'll give you a little bit more. I am the oldest child of five. Uh, all of my siblings and I are now married. I actually have two kids and one on the way. She is due in August, and I'll give you a little bit more info on that as I tell you a little bit more of our history. Um, and I come from <laughs> what a term that I learned today. I have two-parent privilege, and uh, I'm extremely grateful that I had two-parent privilege, and I'm extremely grateful that my wife and I are providing two-parent privilege for our kids as well. So that was probably one of the better things that I've already learned thus far today. So a little bit about who I am, and I'll give you guys a little bit more as uh, it's relevant to some of this style information. Okay, so one of the things that guys in my corner of the, of the internet, whether that's men's influence or style in general, one of the questions that we often take for granted is, why does any of this stuff matter? But especially with the style guys, why does style matter? I mean, it's just clothing, you know? It's just linen or animal hair or something else that's put on my body and really, originally, it was just to protect me from the elements. So why does any of this matter? You guys ever thought about it? So one thing that it does do is it helps our brains shortcut and be able to make judgments based on patterns. Now, the world will tell us that that's bad, that we shouldn't make those judgments based on those patterns. And to a certain extent, I agree, as long as you're willing to make them and then override them once you're given different information. But we can't always assess everything based on its own merit. We have to take those shortcuts. We have to use those patterns. And clothing is a huge way to do it. Now, in the course of the day, I've already had three gentlemen come up and introduce themselves to me and say, I knew you were a speaker. Why do you think they knew that? It's because of what I was wearing, right? One of them specifically told me, he said, you don't roll into a conference looking like you do and not be a guy who's speaking and presenting, right? I haven't done anything else. We hadn't said anything. We hadn't communicated. Sure, there's body language and there's presence, but even that is either exaggerated or downplayed by the clothing that I choose to wear. So style is a big one, and it's one of those things that it helps us facilitate our interaction with the rest of the world. It helps us determine who's in tribe and who's out tribe. It helps us determine the value of what we have. It helps us signal our status. It helps us signal, uh, signal our fertility. It helps us signal all these other traits that we seek as virtuous in other people and it applies just as well to men as it does to women. However, there's a big difference between the way that men and women should approach style. And this is one of the things that I see a lot, because most men have kind of this either negative relationship with their appearance, or they just have a neutral one. They assume that as long as I don't look bad, then I don't really care how I look. And I'll tell you that any guy who says that he doesn't care about his appearance, all you have to do to call him on his bluff and say, all right, come to work tomorrow in a Snuggie, a pink one, right? One of those big old blankets with sleeves. No guy's going to show up to work in that because he's going to be embarrassed by it, and he's not going to feel comfortable or confident in it. And so men, we do care about our appearance, but mostly we just care, care about it in this neutral context. As long as I don't look bad, then I'm fine. As long as I don't look ridiculous, then I'm fine. But we miss out on so many opportunities for what our clothing can do for us by not getting into the positive realm 
of having our appearance do good things for us as opposed to just not doing negative things. Now that jumps into this whole concept of visual appeal versus visual power. As I speak to guys at different conferences, as I meet men across the country and even throughout the world, one of the things that guys who are new to the world of aesthetics or style tell me is, oh yeah, my mom used to dress me, or my girlfriend buys clothes for me, or my wife dresses me. Nine times out of ten, I don't need them to tell me that because I can tell. Because when a woman dresses herself, her primary goal is visual appeal. She wants to accentuate the things that are appealing about her. We've learned that that's part of a sexual strategy, that's part of accentuating the things that biologically we as men are attracted to in women. The problem is, is they take those same goals and then when they apply them to you, you end up looking cute. And no man should ever look cute. It's not your goal, it doesn't help facilitate what your goals are, it doesn't help accomplish what you want to accomplish. No man should ever look cute. Instead, a man should be seeking visual power. All right, it's a subtle difference as far as what's actually accomplished aesthetically, but socially it's a huge difference. And that's why it's very easy to tell, for me it was pretty easy to tell the difference between those who were speakers or those who run their own businesses, those who are kind of here to help with the conference, versus some of you guys who are brand new here to learn. And I don't mean that as a value judgment, but it certainly is an observational judgment. It's pretty easy for me to tell because some of you guys look like you just don't care or that at least you care not enough to look bad or that you just at least want to look kind of good in the way that a girl would think you would look good, but you don't look powerful. And I'll tell you, one of the biggest secrets to dressing well is to not care at all what a woman thinks about the way you dress. Because if you think about it, so much of, a, of what your clothing communicates is what your social status is within your tribe. And we'll talk about tribe a little bit further down. But the value of men within the tribe is always, 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 or at least almost always, but mostly always, determined by the other men within the tribe. It's not by the women. The women will reinforce that, but it's not determined by the women. And the problem that most men have, whether it comes to pick up and just trying to define their self-worth by how many women they can bed, or trying to dress in a way that's attractive to women, is that we're allowing our value to be determined rather than be reinforced by a relationship with women. When it should be something that's reinforced by the tribe. For me, that's my God, that's my country, that's my family. Those are other variables, but it's your tribe, not just who's this hot person and what does she think of me and does she like what I'm wearing? Does that make sense? Okay. So I'm gonna show you some ways that we can actually see the difference here. What's your reaction to a photo like this? I see a dude putting on makeup, right? A little bit kind of uncomfortable. Maybe you shouldn't feel uncomfortable because we live in a progressive world and I don't know what to think about this and blah, blah, blah. But viscerally, you're just, that just doesn't look right, right? Because he's accentuating things that are visually appealing. By making his eyes look bigger, he looks more innocent. He's got soft skin tones. It's not indicative of hard work. He doesn't look like he's willing to embrace any sort of physical risk. There's nothing there about a protector or a provider. Now you see a woman putting makeup on and it looks fine, it looks great. Okay, let's take it uh, one step further. And you see an older gentleman who's getting a little bit of makeup put on and you see this in the context of, okay, he's probably a broadcaster, maybe he's a politician who's going on national news. It's not that big of a deal. You can start to see a little bit of the context of it. This is kind of a neutral, right? It's neither good nor bad, it's just making sure that things are good. All right, what do you think about these guys? That's makeup, right? That's a whole ton of makeup. But that is a whole different story that they're telling. Is that appeal or is that power that they're communicating? That's power, right? You think you'd want to go into war against those guys? Why, they're a bunch of pansies that are wearing makeup, <laughs> right? No, <laughs> that's a whole different story that they're telling because of what they're doing with the same objective content. That's the power of style. That's the power of understanding the difference between visual power and visual appeal. These guys are masculine, dominant, intimidating men as opposed to the guy before that was neutral, the one before that who was effeminate. So that's one of the big differences. All right, let's go a little bit further with this. What do you think, power or appeal? Appeal, okay. I would say there are a few things in this that are indicative of appeal. You've got all the lacing, right? He's got the tights on, he's got the white gloves, he's got the powdered wig, the mole. This guy does not look like he has ever been anywhere near a day of hard labor, right? Not even close. And even then when this was 
culturally appropriate. You think of like the Scarlet Pimpernel as kind of the good balance between this refined dandy versus the, the rugged individualist who was actually going out and doing things. Even then, this was still kind of a weird way to communicate masculinity. But take this similar outfit to the next level. What do you think? Power or appeal? Yeah, but he's wearing lace. He's wearing skinny pants. He's got a powdered wig on. Why is it power instead of appeal? Colors, okay. Cool. Go ahead. Environment. Yeah, the environment. Part of it is that you know who he is and what he's done, right? Part of it is that you know the context of what this man has done and the environment in which he finds himself versus this gentleman over here. But that's the great thing about style is that it can either reinforce all of these other variables that help you communicate your masculinity to the rest of the world or it can provide a contrast to them and downplay it. What you want to do, especially in a world that doesn't value traditional masculinity, especially in a world that tries to tell you there's only one way that you can actually aesthetically express that masculinity, is you want to figure out the best way that you can do it and then leverage it as much as you can because the contrast between you and the sissy, limp-wristed hipsters of the rest of the world is going to be so much stronger, and it's never been easier to dress better than it is now. So you can thank the baby boomers for ruining the idea of masculine aesthetics, right? So huge difference between those two. How many of you guys have seen this image before? Right? OK, a little bit. You ever thought about this? To me, this is the perfect summation of the difference between visual appeal and visual power. Because if you think about it, a well-tailored suit doesn't really show a whole lot of skin. Right? It's not showing anything that's actually going to be turning a woman on from an appeal standpoint. You have no idea what kind of shape a guy is in. I mean, yeah, you have some general context, but you don't know for sure. You have no idea about anything from an appeal standpoint, but it tells a whole story about his power. It tells you about his financial situation. It tells you about his social status. It tells you about his social dominance. It tells you about his attention to detail and his level of discipline. And so it gives you a to an entire story, and those are the things that women are primarily attracted to, and so those are the kinds of things that you can signal by dressing well. Does a well-tailored suit do that? Absolutely. Is it the only thing that does it? Absolutely not. Otherwise, a well-tailored suit objectively across all time and across all cultures would have been the pinnacle of men's style, and it certainly hasn't been. That's something relatively new and relatively recent. So what does this mean for you guys? Because not everybody needs to show up tomorrow wearing a suit. In fact, you can't. Because again, that may not be the story that you want to tell. That might not be the aesthetic that is consistent with the kind of man that you are or the kind of man that you aspire to be. Now, there's a book that I just finished reading. It's called How Will You Measure Your Life? And one of the things that the author talks about is the difference between an emergent and a deliberate approach to life. And this is one of those things that I, uh, obviously doing what I do, I started thinking about it in a style context, and I think that this applies really well. So we'll talk about the difference between a developing style versus a deliberate style. Because one of the things that's so great about being in your 20s is that you don't have to be deliberate about everything right now. How many of you guys had an idea of what you wanted to be in your head when you were five years old? How many of you guys are anywhere near that path? Right? I'm certainly not. In fact, as we dive a little bit deeper, I'll tell you guys where I was when, uh, when I was your age, and I'm not anywhere near there anymore because I was willing to take a developing approach to my life as opposed to always being deliberate and always having to stick to what it was that I thought I knew. Now, the first thing I'll tell you with this is when you're, being, when you're taking this developing approach, be willing to make mistakes. There's a lot of mistakes going on right in here. So this is me about five years ago. So this is right when I started the site. And that's just like a whole vomit mess of me trying a whole bunch of different things, right? Bright blue trousers, a dress belt that's old and crappy, this awful mustache, the stupid target trilby. It's just, it's bad. And I can look at that now, and it's actually kind of one of those things that I even debate about putting up here, because in one way I could say, well, that affects my credibility. But it doesn't, because I'm willing to take this developing approach to my style and get better and better at it, as opposed to having to double down all the time, even if I've been proven that I'm wrong on something. So don't be afraid to make any mistakes, because you will make mistakes. And it doesn't necessarily mean anything wrong, is, is wrong. All right, so I'll give you a little bit of context about me and then how this worked with my developing style. So this is from 1996. This is me right here, up, up on a hike with my family. And I can't tell you guys how excited I was to get these airwalks. Holy crap. 
At that age, I was just starting to get into the BMX world. I was 12 years old. I was just starting to really kind of establish myself as someone separate from my parents. And so it was becoming this big thing to start to dress in the way that my idols dress. And so I got a pair of Airwalks. And I was so thrilled to be able to have these. But what's funny is obviously you move beyond that. The sad thing is, is I have guys with whom I'm friends. You know, I'm 32 years old now. This is 20 years ago. I have guys that I'm friends with who still dress this way because they've been stuck in what they were when they decided they wanted to change their appearance when they were 12 years old. One of my best friends still looks like he did when we were 12, albeit 20 pounds, 40 pounds heavier. You know what I mean? Like it's just a refusal to change and a refusal to develop and grow. Now I was kind of forced into this because when I was in fourth grade, my parents took me and my siblings out of our public school that we were attending and they put us into a private school. For me, that was something that was really hard primarily because of the uniforms. And it wasn't necessarily hard at school with the uniforms, but it was hard at home because my friends in the neighborhood, the kids that I went to church with, they all got to wear whatever they wanted to church, or they got to wear whatever they wanted to school. And I would see them as I was coming home and I would get teased and I would get picked on because I'm this goody two shoes preppy kid who's wearing a uniform, you know? And so for me, that was when I first started to subconsciously realize that just this little subtle thing was communicating that I'm them compared to their us. I was now ex-tribe just because of what I was wearing and I started to get treated differently even by these kids' parents, even though these were people that I had known for years. There started to be this differentiation in our church group because we were the rich family, which we weren't financially any better off than, than anybody else, but my parents just wanted us to attend the school. And there's this whole thing, that this division that started to happen and for me, it was all focused on the clothing because that was the easiest way for the other kids to recognize it. Because they all went to different schools. They just all went to different public schools. They didn't have to wear uniforms. So as you can imagine, I wanted to get out of that as quickly as possible. We'll turn things forward a few years, and I'm still the same guy, or I was still the same guy that I was when I was 12. When I was your age, this is all I wanted to do. I just wanted to professionally ride a BMX bike. And so I dressed like that was all that my aspirations were. Skinny jeans, a t-shirt, skate shoes, that was about it. But I wasn't any good at it. I wasn't any good at it at all. I was terrible. I was afraid of falling. I was afraid of failing. I had friends who they could learn a trick in two hours, and it would take me two months to learn it. I just never got any good at it. And I started to realize finally at the age of 22, which is kind of embarrassing, that I'm not going to be a professional BMX rider. You know? <laughs> it's like I have to be that far along in my life to realize it's like, OK, this is not where I'm going. So I have to change my path a little bit. So I started to think about different things that I wanted to do, take different approaches. And one of the things that I was doing in between, trying to figure out where I wanted to go, was I got a job as a bank teller. Worked for a credit union. All of a sudden, I had to start wearing a shirt and a tie. I made the transition from working as a teller to working and doing loans when I was six months into the job. So I was only about 23 at the time, 22, 23. And it's kind of a weird situation to be in when you're that young because you are approving or denying loans for sometimes people who are twice or three times your age. You know, there's this inherent authority and power that comes from this position. And I started to realize that if I'm wearing the same baggy shirt and the same too wide or too skinny tie that I was comfortable wearing before, it started to affect the way that these adults would treat me. And so instead, I started to dress up a little bit more. Yeah, I got a lot of grief from the other tellers and the other loan officers because it wasn't in the dress code that we needed to wear a jacket. In fact, I remember our VP of sales showed up one Friday, it was a casual Friday, and he was wearing this awful polo shirt and these triple pleated khakis and just looked awful, and I'm there in a three-piece suit. And he started to give me grief about it, which now I understand is more of this just kind of signaling and him feeling threatened by it. But people started to treat me a little bit differently. And while there was a, a price for that that came with uh, the way that my coworkers treated me, it paid off in spades with my clients or with the people with whom I was actually working. So at this point, I'm in school. I decide that I want to do broadcast journalism. I'm a political guy. And as I'm sure you can probably imagine, I like to talk. Uh, that's why public speaking, this is a high for me as opposed to something I get terrified of. And I decide that I want to be the young libertarian version of somebody like Limbaugh or Glenn Beck. And so I decide that I'm going to get a degree in broadcast journalism. I go through school, I get everything finished, and I graduate in 2010, which is right at the bottom of the economic crisis. No jobs available to me. I had worked for a radio station for a year. I had been putting in 80-hour weeks between working at the bank, 
going to school and doing weekend overnight shifts with this radio station, they didn't have anything for me. It just wasn't meant to pan out. And so what I decided to do was continue to write. And so it was a way for me to, to sharpen my voice and hopefully, hopefully allow myself to be able to get into uh, a better career from where I wanted to be. So I started to write political blogs. I started to write a few different things. And they got too heavy. And so that's when I started Masculine Style. So I start this style blog, not really knowing what I'm doing, but having spent a lot of time reading blogs in between clients at the bank. And I start to create this thing that is now snowballed into something that's so much more. So what does all that whole story have to do with style? What does that mean to go from the guy on the, skate, uh, on the, on the BMX bike to a guy who last year I was all over a few different men's magazines after attending a show in Florence? It's quite the transition, right? And if you would have told me, the little Airwalk kid, that my career and the, and the thing that I was going to be most fulfilled by would not have had anything to do with biking or punk music, but would have had to do with clothing, especially suiting, like dressed up clothing, I would have said no way. But because I took a developing approach and made each one of those transitions throughout my career, then I was able to get somewhere where now I can look back and see all the things that I wanted to be fulfilled by a professional career as a BMX biker or in a music or in a band are fulfilled by what I get to do now. So I haven't betrayed any of those core principles. I've just found a better manifestation for them as I've grown. Now what you'll notice is that if we go backwards, my style has grown with that, right? It's all just a little bit different as far as how I dress. And I didn't go from that, I didn't turn into that from an immediate start with being the little kid wearing the, the two tall ankle so or the tube socks and the air walks. It was a transition. It was a developing approach. And that's the thing that you guys need to be able to do is understand that it's OK to take a developing approach. In fact, that's the right way to do it. Because one of the things that people will do as you start to dress better is they will treat you differently. That's one of the biggest strengths and the biggest weaknesses of changing your style. Because it's the easiest thing to do if you want to start a new chapter of your life. You can go to the mall. You can pick up a few outfits for a couple hundred bucks and you can be an entirely different person to a stranger than you were the day before. But the people who you know are going to resent that. Because one of the things we value most as people is consistency. We value it in ourselves, and we certainly value it in others. We're threatened by change, we're threatened by inconsistency, and we almost always treat it like it's hypocrisy as opposed to growth. And so a lot of times it ends up being more detrimental than positive for you guys to make a too quick change into something that's an aspiration of yours, even if it's an aesthetic aspiration. That's why it's oftentimes a lot better to do it gradually one step at a time. I have a brother-in-law who we went and did, man, this is probably four years ago. We went out and did a whole day kind of helping him get some new clothes. And it was something that was different, completely different than anything he'd been wearing before. And what it did is it told a different story, it told a different story to his family, to his friends, to all these different people. And it put him in a pretty unique and a pretty tough position. And it'll do the same thing for you. If you're, if you're up for it, then it's a good thing to do and to do it quickly and more drastically. If you're not up for it, then you're better off doing it more gradually and more slowly. Because what it did is it raised the level of expectations that not only everybody else had for him, but the level of expectations that he had for himself. So if those expectations rise, and you can use that as a catalyst for other much more important aspects of self-improvement. Because as important as this is, this isn't super, this isn't integrity. This isn't your moral compass. This isn't your, your relationship with your family. This can just facilitate this. But if you can handle a drastic change in the way that people treat you differently because your expectations are raised when you start to dress better, make a drastic change and live up to those expectations. And my brother-in-law wasn't quite ready for that. And so he started to fall back to the way that he used to dress because he was comfortable with the way people treated him based on the way that he used to dress. So if you're not quite at that point and you know that you still want to improve, which you wouldn't be here if you didn't want to improve, then just do it gradually. Do it step by step and take that developing approach. And then at the point when you start to figure out what you want to do, that's when you flip the switch and you go into a deliberate approach. Now I know what I want to do for a career. I've known that for three and a half years, and I've been able to double down. 
I don't have to think about what would happen if I were in a different company or if I were in a different industry or if I were doing something different because now I know where I am and what I want to do. I can take a deliberate approach and I can double down on it. And the same thing happens with your appearance. Once you know the general direction in which you want to head, then you can double down, you can start to get more deliberate and that's when you can really, really start to dress well. So how do you do that? How do you figure out what you want to do and how you want to dress? Because it's not just a matter of find something that fits. If you're a big guy, wear vertical stripes, or if you're a skinny guy, wear horizontal stripes. It's not just about the rules. Because again, there are very few things that are actually objective about aesthetics. What's up, 21 University? I hope you guys are enjoying this presentation. I know I certainly had a blast giving it at the under 21 convention. And I know that in this, there is a lot of philosophical and strategic stuff and a lot of times what you need to get the ball rolling to start dressing better is some actionable advice you need to know the things that should be in your wardrobe the basics or maybe how you should dress according to your body like the patterns or colors or things like that that you want to wear so if you want to know some of that stuff i've got a program for you it's called dress like a man i've got it linked for you here Go check it out because I have a special discount for you guys as 21 University members. I'm excited to see how you guys do and to see you start dressing more intentionally. The big thing, find your tribe, okay? Who are the people that you want to spend your time with? This has been referenced a few times in here, but who are your top five? Who are the people that you want to actually be defined by? Who are the people that you want to aspire to be like? What do they dress like? What do they look like? Because every single tribe has a very different appearance. I mean, take something as simple as high school sports. What's the difference between my high school and the high school up the street? Geographic location? I mean, really, that's about it. You know, it's similar socioeconomic status, it's similar racial makeup. It's pretty dang similar. We just happen to live in different neighborhoods. But all of that is very much exaggerated by the fact that they have a different mascot. They wear different colors in their uniforms. And they do things differently that make them a different tribe. And so much of that tribe is signaled by what it is that they're wearing. Think about your experience in high school. The kids that all grouped together, did they all look the same? Was it really pretty easy to tell the difference between the guys who played football versus the guys who were out in the back getting high? How about the difference between the guys who were playing Dungeons and Dragons versus the guys who were, I don't know, playing lacrosse. Pretty easy to tell, right? And how do you tell that? By the clothing that they wear. That's how you signal to the guys who are in your tribe that yes, I am part of your tribe, and to the guys who are not, that no, I don't want anything to do with you, you're not part of my tribe. And so if you want to know how to dress, don't start with how to dress, start with who you want to be, and then find out the way that the men that, that live that way, find out how they dress and aspire to be like them aesthetically and use that as a way to catalyze your desire to be like them in other more important ways as well. So I'll show you how this works for me, especially because tribe is something that is not just you. The beauty of tribe is that it's bigger than you. So I have three main tribes by which I define myself. The first is my church. This is Joseph Smith. He's the founder of the church. The second is my family. So it's me, my wife, my daughter and son. We've got the third on the way. And the third is the company that I'm part of. It's called Beckett and Rob. We do custom suits, and uh, these, two, uh, these two other guys are the founders. These are my three main tribes. When I do something, when I do anything, I don't just represent myself. I represent these groups. Your opinion of my family is already being determined by the amount of time that I've spent talking to you today. Your opinion of the company I represent, your opinion of the church that I'm part of, these are things that are determined if you haven't had exposure to anything else, by what I do and by how I represent my tribe. Now for a lot of guys, especially for young guys, that's how it was for me, that's terrifying. It's a lot of responsibility. But men are designed to thrive under responsibility. That's what we're supposed to do, is shoulder that responsibility and use it as a, use it as a way to improve ourselves. And so one of the big benefits of tribe is not only is it bigger than me and I get the benefits of that as far as I'm protected or I'm represented, but it's bigger than me and that I have to be bigger and better than I would be if I were just left to my own devices. That's why family is so important. That's why country is so important. That's why even a group like this is so important because you guys already feel more of a kinship with each other, especially if you've had the opportunity to talk to each other in between breaks than you would have beforehand. This is already starting to become a tribe. And if you don't have one, 
I would say look to each other. Look to each other as a way to form that. But that's a big aspect. So how do you find your tribe? Right? We just have to keep diving deeper and deeper into this. Can you imagine if you were to wake up after being knocked out and you were in a raft in the middle of the ocean and that's your only view? What do you do? What direction do you head? What difference does it make? Right? You don't even know what's the difference between swimming this way or that way or any other way. It's all just blue ocean. There's nothing to look at. Right? There's no difference whatsoever. And a lot of times, for a lot of guys, that's how it feels when I tell them, well, yeah, let's just start dressing better. Okay, well, what does that mean? Do I have to wear a suit like you do? Does that mean that I do like the streetwear thing and I buy a bunch of Jordans? Or you know, do I have to dress like a motorcycle? Like, what, what does that mean? You know, there's so many different directions and so many different choices that most guys don't even know what to do with it. Okay, is it a little bit easier if you have a few different islands to swim to? What if you are right there in the middle? It's easier. Right? But how do you know which island to swim towards? What if somebody told you that you would be happier at this island than at this one, or maybe at that one? Well then, yeah, that makes it easy. But at least you're narrowing it down and getting it even easier to do what you need to do as far as getting yourself taken care of and taking advantage of that growth. Okay, so that's all a tee up to the fact that I have three different islands I can help you guys swim towards. Okay. I've defined these as the three masculine style archetypes, and I'll help you guys understand what these are so that you can use them as a way to not only find your tribe, but develop your aesthetic. And again, these are all ways to just catalyze your desire for growth in more important areas. So the first of these is the rugged archetype. Now, as soon as I say the word rugged, you probably already know what I'm thinking about. A rugged man is someone who is defined by his relationship with the physical world. These are guys who bend nature to their will. These are the guys who are the lumberjacks and the cowboys. They're the iron workers and they're the rugged individualists. A rugged guy is someone who is capable of fitting the old school, traditionally American definition of masculinity. Now, if you fall in this way, there's definitely an aesthetic that goes with it. I do not represent that aesthetic at all, right? Bravo represents that aesthetic very well. Very good representation of the rugged aesthetic. Okay, let's say that you don't fall into that. Let's say that you are someone who is better defined by your relationship within the social or even the financial world. That's the refined aesthetic. These men are men who shape the world in their image based on their relationships with other people, based on their relationships with society, based on what they're able to do financially and through social status and through civilization. Okay? The refined guys are the guys who are the bankers or the nine to fivers to even some extent. These are the guys who are the media moguls and the men who helped build the entire Western world that we even live in, okay? Again, very much an aesthetic that goes with that. But let's say that you don't fall in with either one of those. The third one is rakish. So we've got rugged, refined, and rakish. Now the rakish archetype, the rakish man, is defined by his rebellion. He's the kind of guy who likes to break the rules. He's the guy who likes to my mother-in-law calls it throw rocks at squirrels. He just likes to get a reaction out of people. <laughs> you know what I mean? The rakish guy just loves to be a little, bit, a little bit dark triad, even though it's not necessarily super Machiavellian. He's the kind of guy, who, and he certainly could be, but the moral rake is someone who just likes to break the rules a little bit. He's defined by being a rebel, he's defined by going against the grain, and he's happy to take on that social risk and feel like he's on his own as opposed to having to follow the way that the rest of the world works. Now if you want to know where you fall within that, because that's the biggest thing, is knowing which one of those three islands to swim towards, once you find that, then you can start to double down even more because there are sub-tribes even within there. You can start to find who the men are that fit within that archetype and then you can start to build yourself that way. What's fun is when you realize that you actually have an element of all three and then you start to play with them a little bit. I'm kind of a mix of refined and rake, which is why I'm wearing a sport coat, even though it's stupid hot under these lights. And, but it's bright yellow, right? Like I'm not wearing this if I'm going to a board meeting in New York City, but I'm certainly gonna wear this for an event like this or if I'm at a men's show in Florence, Italy. Because it, for me, it's the right balance of who I am, who my audience is, who my tribe is, and how all those things work together. That's why I can wear something like this and feel comfortable in it and look confident in it because I am using this clothing as a way to externally express what I want you to know and respect about me and what I know and respect about myself. 
If you know all this, if you have the understanding of the philosophy behind your clothing, if you understand the approach of power versus appeal, you understand where you fall within those archetypes, then you're no longer being worn by your clothing. It's no longer just a neutral, and you certainly don't ever look cute. What you do is you convey a sense of power, you convey a sense of confidence, and a sense of charisma that people will pick up on before a word ever crosses your lips, before eye contact is ever made, or before they ever know anything else about you. And again, it can either buoy up and exaggerate the things that are communicated through your posture and your body language, or it can work to contrast it. But I'll tell you that when you have your style down pat and you know that it's perfectly communicating what you want it to, you can't help but stand a little bit taller. You can't help but project your voice a little bit better to hold deeper eye contact because you feel like you're actually expressing your genuine self to the rest of the world and it makes you feel bulletproof. It's pretty cool. So if you want to know where you fall within those three archetypes, I've got a little quiz. Seven questions. It's really easy. It's really different especially because most guys when they think of style, they don't necessarily think of what do I do with, you know, would I rather live in the 1920s or ancient Greece or would I rather work on an oil rig or in a law firm? But those are the kind of questions that I ask and I use those to help you guys understand what it is that you should actually be aspiring to when it comes to your aesthetics. And this is where you can check out my social stuff. I've left quite a bit of time, but it's because I usually get a lot of Q&A when we go through this. So I will call it at that and then open it up for questions. So thank you guys for your time. Yeah. Go, say that again. Go back a slide. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, guys, who's got questions? Because I know those come up. All right. So say you know after the quiz what archetype you want to follow. What are some good resources that you can model those people and kind of get a sense of uh, what outfits to wear or buy? Um, I give you some of that within the answer on the quiz itself. But the biggest thing is to try to understand even just kind of in broader strokes who those people are. A lot of it for me even comes down to media. You know, if I'm the refined guy, um, I will watch Bond movies, even old Bond movies. You'll watch something like Downton Abbey or something else where you can kind of stereotypically assume that that's where it, what fits that archetype. And then from there, you can start to dive in even further. A lot of it, again, comes down to even paying attention to what the men who you would consider to be a hero as far as in other aspects, the way that they are with their business or with, uh, with women in their life or anything else that you're aspiring to. See if you can figure out where they fit within those archetypal ratios. It's kind of like the OODA loop, where you just observe and then you orient and you go through there. And then that way it helps you get to where you're used to seeing it and then you can start to see what you emulate, what you want to emulate, and then you can abandon what you don't want to. Make sense? Yeah. Okay, cool. Hey. Um, with so much of your following being online, obviously um, your style and everything is exaggerated because people don't have that opportunity to connect with you in person. So. Is that something you're very mindful of with your fault like online and uh, on your various platforms? Is that something you think about? That's, that's a great question. Let me just reiterate it to make sure I understand what you're saying. Um, is my style exaggerated because I am aware of my presence being online and uh, do I use that as a way to kind of leverage what it is that I'm trying to do? Yeah, okay, that's a good question. Um, I think it's kind of a chicken and egg scenario because I genuinely like this stuff. You know, you, you could scroll through my Instagram feed and it's just a bunch of menswear dudes because I genuinely like figuring out how to make the jacket or the shoulder on a jacket fall better or how to get the difference between a good Blake welt versus a Goodyear flex welt on a pair of shoes or something to that effect. And so I genuinely do kind of geek out about this. But part of it too is that I absolutely understand that I'm representing a brand or representing masculine style when I'm doing things too. Uh, so much of this is even more so the case because I'm in Salt Lake City, which like I said before, is not really known for its menswear. You know, I wear something like this here and I get attention for it. And I've learned that in most parts of the world, the way that I dress is something that draws attention, but that's even more so the case when I'm at home. And I have chosen to kind of embrace that pressure. I like it because it makes me understand that I'm always representing my three tribes. And so I like that it's a little bit more exaggerated because then I am always 
conscious about whether or not I'm representing those tribes well. So if you, if you like the pressure of it, if you're fine having that kind of attention put on you, go for it. I would say even go more, a little more exaggerated than you would otherwise. Yeah. Hey, good, good evening. Um, you talk about uh, three different um, styles and approaches to um, how we're supposed to dress. Um, what are some items uh, which would meld all three styles, which you would recommend to keep in a men's wardrobe? That is another good question. And not to shill my stuff, because I do have this as a product. Um, it's the 30 staples, and it's something that you can pick up on the site. But there are, there are some things that, irrespective of your archetype, every man should have in his wardrobe, especially because they either kind of transcend those or because at some point in your life you're going to need them. And so for the most part, those are things like a simple navy or a gray suit, a good pair of dark jeans, um, a solid t-shirt, a good uh, leather jacket, a uh, good Oxford cloth button-down shirt, a good pair of work boots, and a few others that they all kind of fall within the three archetypes. And then they, irrespective of where you are, as long as you're in Western culture, they will always look good and you'll always just look like you're dialed. Yeah. So I want to address this from a cost aspect. Mm -hmm. I went to Men's Warehouse one time and I wound up paying about a thousand bucks for one outfit. And I feel like that was completely ridiculous. Um, I think the general correlation is that dressing well costs money. Mm -hmm. Where is there a, uh, you know, what's a, a happy medium there? Does it, I guess what I'm at, uh, asking is if, if you go to Bell's or, you know, an, an easy store like that, can you still make yourself look good? Yes. Yeah. No, it's a great question. Um, the big thing that it comes down to is the value in it. And I'll tell you that guys who are in a developing stage in your style, shop at H&M, shop at Forever 21, shop at Target. Don't spend a lot of money because you're going to go through stuff quickly because you may not like it. And don't hesitate to try on things that make you a little bit uncomfortable. Um, and don't worry about the cost because you can get stuff for, for pretty dang cheap. And so there are certainly ways to shop cheap. At the same time, once you know what your style is and you start to double down on it and you really start to get good at it, or when you're buying those staples, then it's worth the value to invest in quality things. And most men, I feel like, kind of reject that where, you know, I have guys who they will spend 50 grand on a boat and 60 grand on a truck to tow it, and they will spend X dollars in insurance and everything else for wakeboard gear and all these other things, but they'll come into my shop and say, yeah, a thousand bucks for a suit, man. I just can't afford that. It's like, well, of course you can. You just don't understand the value in it. And I'm not saying that you personally don't understand the value in it, but most men, most men don't understand the value in our clothing, and that's because we're not good at it. If you're good at it, then it's not that big of a deal to wear a pair of shoes that cost $600 because I know that these will last me for 30 years. I'll give them to my son. I may have to resole the shoes versus buying a cheap pair from Aldo and having to replace them every two years, one, because they're crap, and two, because the style isn't going to be consistent and it's not going to last that long. So I would say take the cheap approach in your 20s, one, because of the financial situation that most of you guys are in, and two, because you're in that developing stage in your style, but don't stick there. See the value in your clothing and see the value that's communicated by investing in quality clothing once you understand what it is that you want to wear and, uh, and you're doubling down on it. Does that answer your question? Okay, cool. Hey, how you doing? Um, I'm just curious, is there any way that you can possibly buy an amount, like for example, five pants, five shirts, five jackets, and carry on mixing them over and over so that you, how many times can you mix that outfit? That is a great question. Because I have a very, very, very limited cupboard space. Uh huh. I, I live in a boat, so I've got oh, that yeah. cupboard and that's it. Yes. Okay. And then I've got t-shirts, then I've got jeans, and then three pairs of shoes, and I'm done. I love it. No, so. I love it. That's a fun challenge. And that's, uh, I think for most men, we don't want a wardrobe that rivals our wives. We, we just have no interest in that, you know. I'm kind of, I understand that I'm unique and that I like shoes, I like clothes, I like owning a lot. But most men don't, and I don't think that that's, that's unique or an anomaly. The best thing to do is focus on simplicity and how that works with versatility. I can't wear a jacket like this more than once a month because then it becomes pretty obvious that I've got a limited wardrobe and I'm on repeat. If I have a blue suit or a gray suit, then I mean, think about like Don Draper in Mad Men. How many suits does he own? I don't know. He's always just wearing the same gray suit. You know it's not the same gray suit because the dude makes a ton of money. 
but you're not really focusing on that particular item, you're just focusing on the man who's wearing the clothing. And ultimately, unless you fall within the rake archetype, that's what you want. You don't want people to see your clothing. They don't want to think, wow, that's a great looking suit. You want them to think, wow, you look great in that suit, if that difference makes sense. And so by focusing on simplicity, by focusing on fit, by focusing on a color range that's usually between white, gray, and blue, and then by focusing on solids as opposed to patterns, then that's when you can maximize on all that versatility. You can start to mix and match different things. And so it looks like you're getting a whole bunch of different outfits out of limited pieces as opposed to everything being used as just a one-off. Yeah, so does that answer that? Okay. Yeah. Um, what's the best way to find out what style is right for you? Like, what factors uh, should one look at himself and say, hmm, is it like music or? It's a good question. Um, because it's not necessarily, I mean, yeah, it's, I would have answered 10 years ago that it's music. And that is one of the questions that I ask my clients. I don't do a whole lot of coaching anymore, but when I do, I ask them things like, Are, do you consider yourselves to be an introvert or an extrovert? What kind of music do you listen to? What's your ideal night out? What's your ideal career? Um, what are your aspirations? What are your own personal limitations? I don't think there's one golden question, but it's being able to understand yourself well enough that you're willing to incorporate all of those aspects and then see your clothing as a way that can help you overcome the things that you don't like yourself and then get better at the things that you want to improve on. Because again, it's so important to understand that clothing is just a tool, it's just a means to an end. If you define yourself by your clothing, that's your job is to define me by my clothing. That's not my job. It's my job to define myself first and then use my clothing as a way to communicate that to the rest of you. And so the better, the better way to look at it is, how do I want to be as a man? What are all my aspirations? Who are other men that fit those aspirations? And that's again part of that tribe aspect. And then how do those guys dress? Do, I, do they all dress the same? Okay, that's easy, then I'll dress like them. Do they all dress a little bit differently? Okay, well then how do I blend those different elements? And that's where you take that developing approach and experiment with different things. See what you like, see what other people respond positively to as opposed to negatively to. And then once you figure out what works, double down on it. Yeah. Make sense? Okay, cool. Tanner, um, thanks for coming out first off from uh, Salt Lake City. That's Happy pretty far to. away. Um, so kind of from like a practical standpoint, I really enjoyed the part where you talked, to, you showed pictures of, you know, 17th century men versus like George Washington. Um, they're kind of wearing the same thing and, but when they're from a clothing aspect, what specifically makes a, a an outfit look clothing like powerful as compared to not. I, I think someone could wear the same thing you're wearing mm -hmm. and not look powerful if they didn't put it together right. From a practical standpoint, right. could you give like, you know, sort of like a, a few guidelines on Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Let me go back to that slide. Because there are a few things at play here that make this work. Okay. So one is the power of contrast. Have you guys heard of the contrast principle? It's one of those things that influencers and marketers use a lot. Uh, if you're interested in understanding this, there's kind of a fun study that you can do by yourself. Fill up three buckets with water, one with lukewarm, kind of room temperature water, one with really hot, one with really cold. You put one hand in each of the more extremes and then you put them both in the same bucket of water and they're both gonna feel very different even though they're both in the same environment. The one that was in the hot is gonna feel cold and then vice versa, it's the contrast principle. The same thing is at play with your style. Now, if you think about this, so much of Washington's aesthetic here is incredibly refined. It's very dandy, it's very dainty, right? He's got the powdered wig, he's got the, uh, he's got the lace up there, same thing with down in his sleeves, it's a skinnier fit. But then we've got the things that we traditionally associate with the military. He's got the epaulets up here, he's got the taller collar, which visually puts all this weight up here at his shoulders, and so it gives him more of that masculine V-shape that we're after. We understand the context of where he is, that it's a little bit more rugged of an environment. And then you also know, just based on your own historical context of the fact that he's a, sh a soldier in the field, that the texture of the clothing in this is gonna be much rougher and much more durable than something like this. This is gonna be silk, versus this may be something like a waxed, uh, a waxed cotton or a really heavy wool or something to that effect. And so even though the silhouette and the outline or some of the details are still very similar in the rugged environment versus the refined, 
you've got these more rugged elements along with him being injected in the rugged environment itself that provides that contrast principle. And that's what, to me, makes him look even more powerful than some of the guys who were completely dressed down. And I think that's one of the reasons why, historically, officers had that balance of being refined and being set apart, because they are in this environment, but they're not defined by it like the regular foot soldiers are. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 And so you use the, those social principles along with the natural principles as a way to create an aesthetic that communicates so much presence and so much power that in this kind of environment, it doesn't work, right? Okay, cool. Who's next? Awesome stuff, guys. That's all the time we have. Okay. Good stuff for you.